Okay, so yeah. our participants are the rector of the University of Rijeka and the full prof professor of epistemology uh, at the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences in Rijeka, Snežna Prisa Marija, our double doctorate, Ivan Serovac, uh, whose second book on John Stuart Mill and epistemology we are currently waiting for, and prominent politician and political thinker, Nebuša Zelic. Uh, so perhaps the easiest way to begin this panel is to begin with the question that, uh, that actually motivated the panel, um, which would be whether engaged philosophy simply reduces philosophy to other branches of humanities and social sciences, such as political science, political behavior studies, sociology, or perhaps um, forms of civil service, which are engaged in policy making. Um, and we uh, envisioned this uh, panel as some kind of spontaneous discussion between, between the three of you. So we don't ask you questions one by one. Um, you can all unmute, unmute yourself and just uh, speak as you wish. So shall I? I'm the oldest <laughs> uh, between the others. So uh, I would like to say hello to everybody. It's definitely, uh, I'm honored and feel privileged to, to participate at this uh, panel uh, concerning the engaged, engaged uh, philosophy. Uh, and um, I, Hannah, you, you asked us uh, uh, to answer on, on the question whether whether the engaged philosophy uh, a real philosophy, and uh, I would like to say yes. According to my opinion, it seems to me that engaged philosophy is real philosophy or should be uh, recognized as the real philosophy. But I um, actually it, it remind me on on the the, the title of the. Uh, Goldman's article uh, when he tried to legitimize the social epistemology at some point and uh, he said he put you know the title of the article is uh, does uh, social uh, social epistemology uh, is social uh, epistemology real real uh, philosophy or real epistemology uh, but uh, I think that uh, uh, we need uh, uh, probably to to uh, to rethink uh, which kind of arguments or the argumentation uh, we have on our our sides because um, uh, it seems to me that there is a lot of let us say interesting issue that could be um, discussed here. Uh, yesterday we discussed with. Uh, draw uh, the differences between the applied and engaged and he definitely explained to us uh, you know this the crucial methodological difference be, be, because the applied uh, philosophy political philosophy is definitely top down engaged let us say is bottom up uh, uh, if I may to simplify uh, simplify that but uh, I definitely think that we need to, 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 to debate it uh, more uh, uh, aiming to strength uh, to, to, uh, this, this idea of, of, uh, of engaged uh, philosophy. Because uh, just, just to say, um, uh, so, because uh, it, it reminds me, for instance, um, Gauss, Gerard Gauss, I don't know, he actually uh, uh, um, has a, a, an article about the applied ethics you know, and he is definitely against that because, uh, and he said that the philosophers need not to try to apply their philosophy because we will be inefficient at that. So it's probably, you know, the better, be better or the best practice for us to stay in our theoretical uh, safe place uh, because, you know, our, uh, um, entering uh, in, 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 in real life, things could be uh, disappointing, not only for us, but also from the other and the expectations uh, of philosophy, because the philosophy will not be uh, effective in solving the problems. So we have this kind of challenge on the one side, and on the other side, 
For instance, we have the Rortians dilemma. Uh, Rorty, we know that actually uh, declared the, the, the Clark at some point the death of the epistemology. This is the issue of epistemology, and uh, he 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 he, his, he actually try, uh, of, um, offer that we replace um, um, epistemology with the conversational practices. You know, a kind of uh, analysis of conversational practices because we need to be more engaged with the very very concrete cases of the conversation. So it seems to me that we have these, you know, extremes, you know, if I may to, to say that this is the extreme, the Gauss, Gauss's um, stance uh, that philosophy need to stay in this theoretical framework. On the other side, we have a kind of revisionist project of, uh, of the royalty. And there is a very, very big place be between uh, for applied and engaged philosophy so uh, definitely we need to to discuss more uh, more about that but yes the, my my answer will be yes i'm you know uh, completely uh, i'm happy that wolf actually offered to us uh, a kind of framework for uh, what we would like to do and try uh, to do and it could also be said uh, adding to your uh, speech that engaged philosophy has existed before Wolf named it and before <laughs> Wolf uh, publicly announced its birth, because similar trends have been visible in uh, political philosophy and in epistemology and in ethics. So um, what Wolf gave us is a catchy name for something that's become a trend in all relevant philosophical branches. Uh, but uh, maybe Ivan, do you have something to say? But even more, sorry, uh, to, but even more, not only give us, you know, the name, but give us very concrete, you know, um, issue, challenge, you know, uh, to, to mobilize ourselves and try to legitimize, you know, uh, uh, this kind of approach. It's my opinion. Sorry. Um, yeah, I have a, a few things to add, and I'm actually going to continue where uh, Professor Pritch Samaj has uh, stopped um, about offering this new framework, which I think is very useful, though I have some disagreements or some uh, doubts about uh, the conflict between applied philosophy and engaged philosophy. So I definitely <clears throat> agree uh, that the term engaged philosophy had to be introduced. Nonetheless, I was checking, you know, uh, how they uh, used applied with other sciences, like applied mathematics, applied physics, applied medicine, or so, something like that. And it usually turns out that you can uh, use applied in two different uh, senses, in two different meanings can be connected to it. So the first one is when you say that uh, applied philosophy, for example, is when we apply certain theory, uh, abstract philosophical theory on real world problems. Uh, and that is, I think, what uh, Wolf calls applied philosophy in his article. Uh, nonetheless, we can also talk about applied philosophy as applying not theory, but instead of applying methodology or skills or forensic skills of the philosopher on real world problems. Uh, and uh, when we talk about, for example, applied mathematics, uh, it's not that they apply ring theory or singularity theory on real world problems. What applied mathematics does, they apply some methodology, some skills they have developed as mathematicians on real world problems. So it seems to me that uh, it's very useful to introduce this uh, engaged philosophy term in the debate. Nonetheless, it seems to me that they are not in opposition applied philosophy and engaged philosophy, but that applied philosophy is about and then we can see and have applied theory as on the one hand and engaged theory or engaged philosophy on the other. <clears throat> because it seems to me that all these instances are cases of applied philosophy, because in one uh, case we apply philosophical theories in the other we apply philosophical methods or skills developed as philosophers. Uh, so that's what I wanted to, to start and then to answer your uh, question, uh, Hannah, uh, regarding uh, whether something is lost uh, when we... Uh, or reduced or simply... Or reduced. Uh, yes, yes, yes. So, given uh, up. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I also, you know, did a little bit of research and uh, th there was a debate on this in the uh, early 20th century uh, between uh, John Dewey and Bernard Russell. Uh, and Dewey said that uh, philosophy in order to in order to properly uh, fulfill its functions has to help people solve their problems, uh, the problems of life and the other problems they're facing. And Russell had something like, and I'm not quoting, but I'm paraphrasing what he said, that those things, things that applied philosophy deals with and especially engaged philosophy that deals with are trivial. And he says, changes that happen to small pieces of matter on Earth's surface are completely irrelevant for the bigger scheme of things. And in fact, he even considered uh, going to uh, the area of engaged philosophy as a form of philosophical treachery or something like that, you know, uh, or uh, making philosophy trivial. So that is the conflict we are facing. I don't agree with Russell, of course. Uh, I think that most of the panelists here and most of us here agree that uh, applied philosophy and engaged philosophy has its uh, merits in the real world. Uh, nonetheless, uh, it seems to me that the question itself uh, can also be targeted at other scientific disciplines. We can ask ourselves whether, as, whether mathematics loses something when it becomes applied mathematics, or whether physics loses something when it becomes applied physics. And to me, it seems that it does not, uh, though it might seem that it does. Uh, the idea is simply that whenever we have to focus on making real changes in the real world, we have to go for some kind of interdisciplinarity because uh, the world cannot be grasped by any uh, scientific branch or by any scientific theory. And in such instances, we have to move towards other uh, branches of science and other fields of science. So. The same happens with psychology, the same happens with economics and so on. When they uh, try to influence political decision-making, they get closer to other fields of science, but I don't think that's a, that is a problem in itself. Maybe it, it blurs the boundaries. Nonetheless, it does not reduce the epistemic value of uh, this endeavor. Well, perhaps the what makes engaged epistemology uh, distinctive in Wolf's work is that, is that it is bottom up. It's it doesn't only engage. It doesn't only apply um, philosophical methods to problems it sees, but it starts from them. And maybe we can learn something from this in that uh, it's not only about um, making philosophy real world or putting philosophy in the, real in the real world. It's about using the real world as a source of inspiration for our philosophical thought. And I don't know how you stand on these positions, Nebuisha. Well, first of all, hello to everyone. And I apologize that unfortunately I wasn't able to uh, uh, participate in discussions. Yesterday, actually, I was uh, at the city council all day, actually engaged, <laughs> not in philosophy, but in political. So in political part of political philosophy, but without philosophy. Uh, and actually, uh, to, 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 to turn to, well, actually, to the first question about disengaged philosophy, real philosophy, then somehow now right across me in my room is a colleague that actually uh, lectures ancient philosophy and actually for her at least uh, uh, when we speak about ethics and political philosophy philosophy is engaged philosophy actually and somehow uh, in the history of philosophy uh, at least practical branch of philosophy lost uh, this sense of engagement with the real world, actually lost its sense that uh, it should help people solve their problems, as actually you said now. Uh, so I do think that somehow it is uh, uh, great that now we start somehow combining together uh, these uh, uh, things with which philosophy started at the beginning of the 20th century somehow the notion of concept analysis with the uh, uh, awareness of what are true problems in the real world and try to solve them. 
for example, it seems to me that what engaged that how philosophy gets engaged, it's very interesting in a sense that somehow uh, it is good, I think, that philosophy keeps its way, somehow keeps uh, 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 connected with the notion of concept analysis, because somehow it can give to social scientists uh, what questions they should investigate. For example, uh, it's very interesting. Right now, we are engaged in a project on social affiliation. And actually, we are trying to, to, to investigate with empirical scientists to see uh, how people understand the notion of affiliation. Is it through identity? Is it through some way of solidarity? And actually, uh, uh, when we speak with empirical scientists, with social scientists, it is great to see what they understand uh, uh, under the term uh, 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 social affili affiliation and what we understand with philosophical literature background. What is affiliation? What they see? Can it be reduced to some terms that they are used to investigate, something like social trust or something like uh, uh, notion of identity. And then actually we try to say, no, affiliation is much bigger. It includes in a way uh, uh, the uh, 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 sense of belonging to the community that we want to see. Uh, is it only connected with the notion of shared identity? Is it uh, maybe can it be connected with solidarity? So actually, I, I think that uh, 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 we should uh, 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 speak with social scientists in the sense uh, that we can enrich and reach each other. Uh, I think that there is a, a, a role of philosophy uh, in discussion with social scientists as much as we need their data actually to uh, uh, come to our co conclusion and for these data to enrich our work. And actually, uh, there's also, also what seems to me one way of engaging philosophers into the real world is actually from one uh, older paper from Joe Wolf, uh, actually not the last one. I think you discussed yesterday on methods in, in, in philosophy and public policy. He had this paper, I believe it's from 2015, actually uh, uh, that the role of philosophers should also be to see which values are somehow, uh, how to say, uh, uh, which values are somehow not in, in the first row, uh, how to say. Marginalized. Marginalized, yes, uh, in a sense. Uh, so, for example, he says that uh, uh, nowadays we, we are all obsessed in a way with individualism. So somehow the role of philosopher, uh, the, the role of the philosophers is somehow to make a theory of solidarity in a sense that can uh, be well uh, described, well analyzed, and actually it can somehow uh, 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 point to this value that is somehow lost. In, in our theories and somehow in our discussions. So I do think that somehow, but this is also, I believe in a sense, uh, approach that follows this method of engaged philosophy and the method you said somehow bottom up, we have to go in the world and see what is the discourse in the world now. Uh, we have to go in the world and see uh, uh, what people actually what uh, concepts they use and on what arguments they rely and then see that something is missing and then see that uh, uh, there is there are certain values which we in theory think are important but actually in public discussion uh, are not so much used for example and somehow to 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 put them in the focus so uh, and, and the thing about this bottom up, I think it's very important, for example, in, in, in discussing the already I mentioned the notion of affiliation. So, for example, we can be, I don't know, cosmopolites and actually think that the notion of national identity is not so important. But actually, when you go and discuss with people and see the data, you see it is important. So actually saying it is not important uh, will not solve the problems of nationalism. So actually, if we want uh, in a sense engaged, then actually we have to see why the uh, uh, national identity is so important to people 
and see maybe something maybe it can be used in a certain sense to 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 give uh, somehow new substance new content to the notion of identity for example to uh, uh, and not uh, uh, to say it is wrong and simply we, we will not deal with it so somehow i do think that the engagement in the sense of philosophers uh, must include this bottom-up approach that there are many things how actually philosophers can uh, 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 help and uh, have a role in trying to fix the problems or in a sense somehow uh, point to the uh, certain uh, solutions. So you feel that basically uh, engaged philosophy is a venue for empirical evidence to enter ph philosophical debates. It's a venue for um, empirical evidence to come together with abstract conceptual analysis, of, which will which will, will aid us in understanding the world better. Uh, how do the rest of you feel about that, Snežana Ivan? Uh, yeah, uh, definitely engaged uh, philosophy uh, suggests to us uh, that we look uh, the you know this empirical uh, finding stuffs uh, and uh, uh, and it is important uh, at least I don't know what is the situation in your philosophical uh, circles but in our when you mention you know the empirical uh, to some philosophers it's kind of heresy, very heretical things, you know, to, to, to try to, to give a kind of empirical evidences or, or say that you will try to, to test your philosophical, like I say, ish, uh, theory uh, with some empirical evidences. Uh, it is not philosophy, you know, and this is, we, we return to the, to the issue, whether the engaged philosophy or the philosophy or approach that embrace, you know, this empirical facts, it's real. It's real. Um, of course, you know, uh, it's only the, the let us say, the, the, this, uh, our colleagues with whom we disagree, it's not, you know, uh, uh, right in, in that, but definitely, you know, a kind of tension between the theory and, um, let us say, empirical fact practice uh uh is there and, and i really think that that uh this this um debate about um, engaged philosophy um actually focused us or um or directed us to the question the relation between the theory and the practice and, and the real and the real life and what is actually uh, the role of theory uh for for uh, uh the solving solving the problems because uh, um, what uh, Joe said is um, actually uh, not the theory is not important, uh, but you know it. It say that actually we try to 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 get from the concrete concrete uh, problem and then try to solve them, consulting you know the history, the previous examples, uh, the theory. But I'm and that says just wondering really about the role of the theory about. Let us say a uh, uh, philosophy in 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 a sense, because uh, you know, uh, 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 we de definitely uh, uh, can diagnose that the theory, that the philosophy, cannot be directly or auto automatically applied to uh, to uh, for for some to, to for uh, no, some for, for for solving for the solution of some some problems, but. Um, it seems to me that it's not actually it's not the 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 the, the goal of the theory to solve the, the the practical problems actually you know they are per definition you know uh uh, uh, uh idealized uh, well say ideal theory you know that they, they are they are not contextualized uh, they, they are not uh, aimed to to be and to cover all the concrete concrete cases but the theory is According to my opinion, very important because the theory is not just a conceptual analysis. It's not not, not some you know um, structure uh, and system of of thoughts or of ideas, but also this there, there are the elements of values. You know, so I'm just wondering that the theory defines you know a kind of value. So I'm just wondering how we can solve, for instance, some uh, concrete problems without you know some idea. 
about what is the proper values. Yeah. For instance, just, just to be more concrete, in case of COVID-19 uh, crisis, you know, and we try to solve the problem of the vaxxers and the anti-vaxxers, whether we should uh, listen to, to those who deny science. You know. So we have, the, yeah, we have the problem, we have you know, concrete problem we need to solve. But when we do not have some kind of orientation, you know, guiding principles, how we can solve, solve the problem. We have uh, one side who said, I don't know, we, we, would, we would like you know, to be free, not to be vaccinated. And the other, we would like you know, to be, uh, I don't know, free to, to, or, or safe, you know, you, you are, uh, uh, we, you, we need to, 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 to have, the, we, we need to trust science. So we have the different values you know, how to solve the problem in the such case of disagreement, strong disagreement, if we do not have a kind of, you know, guiding principles in that, you know, whether what is actually, you know, freedom, the harm, justice, um, you know, uh, reasonableness. So, um, yeah, it seems to me that we need to consult the theories, but I'm wondering about that, but Joe is here, you know, probably he can help us. <laughs> Well, so in a sense, you're, what? you're what? suggesting what? that um, engaged philosophy is indispensable. And uh, for example, if we take the um, issue of raging economic inequality, which can be best seen in the United States, but also in the United Kingdom, where Joe is from, uh, and basically anywhere, uh, and if, and then if we apply the concepts such as justice and contribution and redistribution and the value of uh, well-being and flourishing and a good life, uh, it does seem as if engaged philosophy is indispensable. How do you feel about that, Ivan? Yes, I mean, I agree. Uh, I would just like to add that, um, so, uh, Engaged philosophy is definitely a wonderful means uh, for empirical evidence to enter philosophical debates. Uh, but we should know that it's not the only way empirical evidence can enter political debates. I don't, I don't think it's its main quality. Uh, there are other qualities that engaged philosophy has, which it should be more famous for. For example, take Peter Singer, for example. So he, uh, he does what... Uh, Wolf calls uh, applied philosophy and not engaged philosophy. But uh, Peter nonetheless uses a lot of empirical evidence, for example, about suffering of animals, but also about, uh, I don't know, abortion and so on. A lot of medical evidence comes in his theory. Uh, so applied philosophy can also use uh, empirical evidence. Uh, the, the main difference and the main advantage, as I see it, of uh, engaged philosophy is not that it enables us to introduce empirical evidence in philosophy, but in that it enables us to introduce philosophy into politics. Uh, and th that is, again, uh, to go back to Peter Singer, when he writes about abortion, for example, uh, he even takes into consideration this famous argument that uh, if we prohibit abortion, then a lot of women will do it nonetheless in unsafe conditions and the total uh, results will be extremely harmful and so on. And then Singer says something like, but that doesn't say anything about morality of abortion. It says only about whether some kind of legislation or some kind of policy uh, produces good or bad consequences, but doesn't say anything about morality of the abortion itself. So it seems that Singer himself is focusing only on what is, you know, morally right or wrong thing to do and it's not actually appealing to what kind of decisions we have to make and unlike uh, singer uh, those engaged in uh, engaged philosophy actually focus on the decision making process on the consequences of particular decisions and not on the acts that the all those decisions try to like regulate so i think this is the main advantage of uh, engaged uh, philosophy <laughs> Uh, thank you. I think all three of you had excellent contributions. So uh, I would like to hand the floor to Marco to continue with our second question. Yes, thank you, Hannah. Uh, so, I mean, your your discussion was was very very rich. So I'll just uh, play a bit of a devil's advocate. Uh, uh, so that it's not too boring. Um, 
So I can imagine someone saying, uh, you know, so you, 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 you're advocating for um, a method in philosophy that engages with empirical data, with real uh, life lived experiences of people. So we need to, to consult you know, what's going on in the real world. So someone might say, I can imagine saying, well, what, what, what is so distinctively philosophical about that? Aren't you just calling for philosophers to engage in, in interdisciplinary work? So, so what, what is the, what, what is so uh, the distinctive about the method of engaged philosophy? Is it really a philosophical method or just a call for, for more interdisciplinary research, something that philosophers traditionally are not famous for, for, for doing? So what, 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 what would you reply to um, someone who would make such, such an, uh, an objection? Well, actually, <clears throat> there was this objection, in a sense, uh, uh, when we applied <laughs> the project uh, uh, on creation uh, science foundation, it was about the notion of social affiliation and actually social justice. And then we actually uh, had in the project that there will be a vehicle investigation with the people with disabilities, uh, uh, how do they feel the notion of social affiliation? Do they connect it with the good uh, uh, services uh, and institutions? Or do they connect it simply with the notion of uh, religious and ethnic identity? And actually, the, uh, one of the reviewers said to the project that there is no need of such a vehicle survey because it is a philosophical project in a sense. So actually, and the reply was that the point is somehow that we uh, need these empirical data, not only in the sense that uh, 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 we need to question our, our, our hypothesis true in a sense, but in a sense to come maybe uh, to have these data to come maybe to a different theory. So it is actually, uh, it is not one way dynamic. In a sense, uh, uh, you can see a data which confirm what you are saying, but you can also see something in the data which can change, in a sense, what you were thinking, which can actually point to the problem you were not aware of. And actually, uh, uh, I, I, I do think that these interdisciplinary uh, work does not undermine the autonomy of each discipline. Every discipline has its has its autonomy because then the enrichment of each other would lost in a sense. Uh, it would be all somehow together. But the point is uh, 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 that uh, we should keep in mind uh, actually somehow that uh, uh, in interdisciplinary work somehow the role must be clear what each side is doing in a sense. But I do think somehow that uh, there is no need, in a sense, to, to, to worry about. I know that what Snezhana was saying, there are many people who say, this is real philosophy, this is no philosophy. But somehow, I do think that actually uh, uh, there is no such clear line. And there shouldn't be, actually. It is impossible to draw this clear, clear line. Yeah, if, and also it could be uh, asked uh, whether it is perhaps dogmatic and whether we have inherited this dogmatic idea that philosophy mustn't in any case uh, engage with empirical evidence. Because now um, in many uh, philosophical fields that um, the sort of interact with other uh, phil uh, social sciences and philosophical branches, such as political epistemology or applied ethics, that empirical evidence is uh, indispensable. So the question could also be how and when we inherited this dogmatic idea that uh, philosophy doesn't need empirical evidence. So um, maybe we could also move in that direction. Yeah, so yeah, if I may, yeah, I saw that 
some some people uh, you know raise a hand but just uh, you know to to to, to share uh, it's it's really the question why we uh, have the, the this idea that you know only you know this you know puristic theoretical philosophy is only real philosophy um and also there is a, another <laughs> false dilemma you know there is the curiosity based approach and the problem solving approach you know so this curiosity based approach you know so the theoretical debates you know it's some you know noble or real philosophical approach you know on the other side problem solved approach is something you know that it's kind of betrayal so because of that you know i think that wolf actually did a great thing you know <laughs> from their position they said you know yeah stop that we we notice what si uh, what uh, hannah said you know a kind of uh, relaxing or naturalizing or uh, a trance in philosophy, political philosophy, epistemology, ethics, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we, we notice that a kind of trend, you know, toward using the empirical facts, interdisciplinarity, what Marcus said. But nevertheless, we feel at some point that it's not something good with us if we would like, you know, to deal with the real problem and, you know, to, 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 to deal with that there is, that we need to justify why we started from that, or that we are not, let us say, the proper proper philosopher. Something is, yeah, so yeah. So uh, and this is important, and I think because of that, the Wolf's, uh, Wolf's project is good because they legitimize, you know, uh, something very very important uh, um, uh, for us and for the for the philosophy uh, uh, as a whole. So uh, when you ask Hannah, you know, about when, you know, can we, you know, trace and detect, you know, the, the origins of this kind of theoretical dogmatism you know i don't know but i, re I it reminds me you know on the other uh, uh, project for, uh, the debate between particular particularism and uh, generalism on the other side you know also about that also it was one um, you know a, a, a movement in philosophy in which you know in ethics you know some people try to say you no know, that something wrong in this theoretical uh, generalist approach that probably we need something uh, different, but you know we it yeah passed and we still stay in this kind of uh, what you say kind of dogmatic dogmatic approach. So because of that, definitely I'm happy. And uh, actually, it reminds me I, I mentioned to several times uh, debating about engaged engaged philosophy, um, uh, and it is connected with uh, Wolf's. Uh, you know, this, uh, uh, he is the analytical mar. No, no, it's not analytical Marxist, but he, 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 he did, he worked in the domain of analytical Marx, I'm not sure. Sorry, we we'll try to interpret you, but it reminds me on the thesis of Forbach, actually, you know, uh, the Marx thesis of Forbach, you know, so that probably, you know, Wolf said, Wolf said to us, you know, the message that probably we need not only to try to interpret or the, uh, make these uh, theoretical uh, things about the world, but also try to, to, to change and make it better. Well, maybe we could allow a couple of questions from the audience now. Uh, Abigail, <laughs> I can see you raise your hand, so feel free to unmute yourself. Hi, um, I just wanted to ask two questions. Um, whether we think philosophy being more engaged is kind of bridging the gap between the analytic tradition and the continental tradition. So is the continental tradition perhaps better equipped to deal with engaged philosophy? Um, and another question is, is the people who resist making philosophy more engaged, are they resisting making philosophy more accessible to maybe the general public? and other um, disciplines instead of writing solely for other philosophers? Like, is there some kind of benefit from keeping it like niche? I don't know how people think about that. Oh, uh, okay, uh, whoever of you are contributors feels equipped to answer these demands, please feel free, even I can- Sorry, I, I can- I can focus maybe more on the on the second uh, question and leave the first one to the the other panelists. Uh, so uh, the question was again whether uh, non-engaged philosophy, purely theoretical philosophy, and so on, makes it less accessible to the public in general. Uh, and I'm really not sure. 
I would like to, 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 to think that that is the case and that we should do more engaged philosophy. Nonetheless, I organize a lot of uh, science popularization, even philosophy popularization events uh, in, uh, in the local community. And what I can see uh, from the events I organize, but also from the events organized by others, is that people actually are attracted to very theoretical stuff. And I don't mean uh, things that are and uh, that they then cannot comprehend. Nonetheless, when you talk about ethics, they don't want you to talk about, you know, some contemporary ethical dilemma, uh, whether it's just war or abortion or euthanasia or maybe something else. They want you to talk about Stoics or to talk about Epicureans and so on. Uh, or if you're talking about uh, political philosophy or something like that, they want you to talk about Plato and so on. They don't want you to talk about uh, um, contemporary philosophers, especially those who are engaged philosophers and try to change policy making and so on. So at least from my experience, uh, it seems that the general public is more interested in this, what we would call hardcore philosophy, uh, when it's made accessible to them. Uh, and I think that's a, a, a common trend that whenever you try to move to this interdisciplinary area, when you try to actually uh, uh, see the problem from different perspectives or the perspectives for different sciences, uh, you are no longer recognized as a philosopher or as an economist or psychologist and so on. Uh, I'm not saying that it should be like that, but as far as I can see around me, that is what's happening. Thank you. Uh, okay, perhaps the first question is a little bit less uncharitable as all three of our panelists are working in the, in the analytical tradition. So whoever of you feels brave enough to uh, tackle this, please go on. Well, I meant in terms of, it's like, should we be bridging the gap instead of like creating dichotomies like in philosophy, like this has to be analytic, this has to be continental or phenomenological. Is it possible to kind of bridge the gap and use things from both instead of having this divide? Yeah, if I, if I may, just to, I, I'm not sure that I can, you know, uh, be, be completely competent to, 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 to uh, answer you, but just, you know, uh, uh, in analytical philosophy, uh, actually, uh, in my field, in, in epistemology, in analytical epistemology, there, 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 there is a kind of, um, how to say, um, um, approach and there's a standard analytical epistemology that completely uh, rely on uh, pretty much isolated um, uh, cognizer uh, as such. On the other side, you have the continental uh, or postmodern, let us say, philosophy who open, you know, the question of, of uh, uh, um, uh, social social element in 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 knowledge because it seems to me that in this kind if we think that postmodern philosophy is actually the continental philosophy they are much more open to this social element before we in uh, analytical philosophy actually recognize that so it seems to me that me <laughs> that we in uh, analytical philosophy uh, are inclined to be even more rigid you know, than let us say, in some sense, that like some uh, uh, um, continental tradition. But definitely, uh, this um, split uh, and fight between analytical and uh, continental, uh, from my perspective, uh, now uh, is um, um, we have, let us say, the, the, the better situation. You know, it's that I, I you're very much, you know, uh, 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 appeal on the intersectionality, try to read each other, you know, try to be motivated and inspiring by the ideas and the approaches from uh, both sides, you know. So I definitely do not believe in this uh, um, um, fight, you know, as the productive, <laughs> productive uh, debate, you know. So I definitely. Uh, can uh, recognize in analytic philosophy a lot of deficits that can be fulfilled or, you know, that we can benefit, you know, reading postmodern or continental philosophers. Uh, Joe, I see you have raised your hand and I could say that you're interested even before, so please um, enlighten us. <laughs> so and it's a really fascinating discussion. There are a few things I want to pick up on. So um, I didn't know about that debate between Dewey and Russell that was mentioned. And it, it's really fascinating that Russell 
is someone who was arguing for the purity of philosophy, given that he made his living out of publishing popular books, like um, you know, Why I'm Not a Christian, for example, Marriage and Morals. And so there, there were the two Russells, uh, there was the logician and the popular philosopher. And it feels like um, he wanted to keep those two things apart in, in his own life. And only one of them was real philosophy. And maybe he was, so I don't know, I mean, I, I can't remember from reading biographies for how he regarded the other work, whether it was just to put food on the table or whether it, you know, he, he thought he was making an important intervention into politics that way. So I need to go back to it. Um, I think the um, a, 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 another point that, that resonated with me was, was this two different ideas of applied philosophy and that you know, when you're doing applied maths, just as you say, you don't take the most refined mathematical theory and try and work out how to calculate how fast something will fall to the ground from, from that. So you, rather you start with a problem and you work, you use whatever theory comes to hand. But I th so um, I did write once upon a time uh, about how I think that a lot of people in moral and political philosophy have got um, an envy of a very outmoded idea of how they think science works. So I think a lot of people, you know, as soon as you, you state it, you realize that this is not true. But a, a lot of people are very envious of the type of scientific model of the universe where you have a you know, small number of theories that explain everything. And you, know, you see this deliberately in, say, Spinoza or Hobbes or Descartes, the idea that we're going to get that theory which unlocks everything, thinking that this is what was happening in the science of the time. And it feels to me that a lot, a lot of contemporary political philosophers and moral philosophers are still stuck in what might be a 17th century model of how science works and the one that scientists themselves have moved on from uh, you know, many years ago. So uh, that idea of trying to get this theory that explains everything. Of course, there are some areas of science where that still happens, you know, theory of gravity perhaps, but that is by far not how science tends to work now, as far as I understand anything. Um, I, I think one, one thing I just want, want to say about the general picture is that I'm not trying to say everyone should do engaged philosophy as I've described it and nothing else. Right? I'm a complete pluralist about this. I think it's great for us that people like Peter Singer are doing the applied work because they're going to work harder thinking about the consequences of utilitarianism for a particular area than I would because they're, we need them. Um, so it's one of the paradoxes of my view, I think, is that philosophy thrives on people with a mistaken idea of what is possible that we, that we need people who have their theory who are trying to work it out um so yeah i always encourage graduate students to be as ambitious as possible knowing they're very likely to fail but in that ambition they're going to maybe get things that they wouldn't have got had they been much more modest to begin with so i think i just just as um others were talking i was thinking so what is my attitude so my attitude roughly is um you know, do whatever interests you and if you can make a living out of it fantastic right? um, and we will benefit from all of it but we'll benefit from it in different ways so i think the distinction between curiosity driven and problem driven is very important i think the point also about when you talk about philosophy to um public audiences they can get much more interested in questions about things like are numbers real or you know, in what sense do numbers exist than any question about say abortion because they can read about that in the newspaper so they, they they come to philosophy as a way of very often allowing them to indulge these things that look like flights of fancy and things that they've been encouraged not to think about in other contexts because they're too difficult and yeah you know, philosophy would be dead if we didn't have that going on so so it's parasitic you know what we're doing in engaged philosophy is parasitic on the whole history and traditions of philosophy but it is curious to me that people are so keen to ask this question, is it real philosophy or not? And um, so my own teacher, Jerry Cohen, was you know, in his, his last work, um, made a distinction between theories of justice and rules of regulation, which is just like the point about Singer on abortion. So Jerry says, the theory of justice tells us this. Unfortunately, if we do it, it would be terrible because we're not ready for it or something. You know, we're not ready for socialism or we're not ready for um, luck egalitarianism or whatever it is. So what we've got to do is 
bribe the rich so that they don't leave the country or something, or, you know, we've, we've got to be much more Rawlsian. And so he claims that Rawls confused the theory of justice and rules of regulation. And that John Rawls has given us a very good theory of regulation, but not a theory of justice. Um, I mean, I can see that point that, that you could have a purist theory of justice where you'd say, if everyone acted as well as I would like them to act, so everyone was a perfect human being, this would be the best theory. But we're not, so we've got to have this other theory, very like Rawls actually on non-ideal theory. We need something else because we're fallen human beings rather than angels. Um, I mean, you can make that distinction. I'm not sure how much point there is to making a firm distinction. And I'm quite amused, really, at um, the length some people go to to try to insist that there is this distinctive thing called philosophy that they're doing. Um, and you know, if I had more inclinations towards psychoanalysis, you know, I'd, I, I'd want to sit down with them and worry about what they're afraid of. Um, because I think partly what the, <laughs> I don't know how you, you feel. When I was going through graduate school and I saw other disciplines like psychology or literature were reading Rousseau or reading Hume, I thought, get your hands off, that's ours, right? Get your own books. Now, you know, these philosophers, they belong to us in philosophy. So this idea that we've got this domain and it's the most important thing that has ever happened and no one else no one else is doing it properly if they're doing it at all. They might be doing some literature, might be doing psychology, they might be using the ideas, but they're not doing philosophy. So I think that this thought that the, you know, the most important things are our unique possession and we're ca carrying on that tradition. You know, it's really important that some people think that, as I say, and do that work, but I also think it's false. So I think you know, there is philosophy going on in every discipline in some disciplines, there are better philosophers than there are in philosophy departments, except they don't call themselves philosophers, but they're doing the same stuff as us. I think in a world where we're trying to break down disciplinary boundaries and saying it's all very unreal, and it's around a sort of 14th century university curriculum, and we've still got these same disciplinary divides, it seems to be something sort of rather distasteful to me, people claiming that only this is real philosophy and, and nothing else is. But as, as I say, uh, we need people who are doing that if, if we're going to get the concepts we can use. I mean, Peter Singer is such an interesting example. So when I was doing work on ethics of animal experimentation, I, I said yesterday, if we'd got Singer in there and he said close the medical facilities, you know, he would have been kicked out of the room. So you know, the idea that he would be the person who would tell us what the new regulations should be is laughable. On the other hand, Everyone there knew his work and knew his arguments. And what was considered an acceptable position has shifted because of work of people like Singer, maybe because of, because of Singer. So this work that is very um, sort of abstract, idealistic in a way, does feed into a discourse, but it does it over a longer period. And it just, it just um, reshapes what people think is morally possible or the space of moral possibilities so you know I was talking to a scientist in his 70s and he said you know when he was in his 20s they would just throw animals around the lab as if they were dead pieces of meat right? the, the level of welfare standards were so low when he started they couldn't care less but then when they started reading some of this work they realized they had to sharpen up a bit a bit and um, they realized what they were doing was wrong. It didn't make them close down the facilities, but it made them understand that um, you know, there, there was more to it. So I think there are ways in which in a longer term, um, this purer work will have an effect. I think everything depends on the context and the context in which I've been writing is a context in which I've been sitting on policy committees that have had to make a report next year to someone who then has to stand up and defend it in front of a hostile audience. Right? And so the idea that you could say, well, as a Kantian, what we, what I said, and therefore the committee is going to do this and the person putting the view forward is going to do that. You know, it's laughable. You know, the idea that you could stand up on the floor of the House of Parliament and say, well, the Kantian position, which we've chosen to adopt for this, is, is going to be blah, 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 or the utilitarian. Um, they, so you need to argue in terms of values that people will recognise. And very often, going back to some of the earlier points, what 
when people are thinking about justice or inequality in the world, it may be that theories help us think about that. But what actually moves people is anecdotal and narrative. So understanding how particular people in the world are affected by particular policies. And then we can move, we can ascend to a theory, but, it, but we don't start just with income data, say, you know, that data is terrible, here's a theory, let's improve it. What we do is we look at income data, we look at the lives that the people at the bottom are living, and think, well, no human being ought to be living a life like that, not when there's so much around, so much else around, and then we can move to theories. But actually, you know, the, 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 as Avner and I wrote, Avner de Chalet and I wrote a book in Disadvantage, that, you know, within the theory of equality, we have this incredible debate going on in the uh, literature for the last 30 years, longer about equality, sufficiency, priority, different versions, equality of welfare, equality of resources. In the end, they all say the same thing for policy tomorrow, which is we should try to identify the people who are worse off and make their lives a bit better. Whatever your theory of equality is, it all converges on that. And in the UK, even the Conservative Party would agree with that. Most people around the world would agree with that. Now, how, how much we make them better, how much they contribute to making themselves better, no, those are, of course, important political questions. But you know, it'll be a long time before we have to debate priority versus sufficiency as a practical matter. And you know, if, if we ever get there, then um, we've done a lot of good. And that maybe we can go off and do philosophy of time after that, because political philosophy will be pretty much complete there. So anyway, um, th these, these are just the um, meta reflections I had on, on your very interesting reflections as we're going through. Uh, apropos this idea that um, engaged philosophy was somehow parasitic. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, your article was published, correct me if I'm wrong, in 2019 or 2018. Uh, so this was after 2016 when all hell broke loose and uh, democracy completely lost its epistemic standing in the UK and in the US. So um, could we maybe say that this very strict articulation of um, engaged philosophy and this method of engaged philosophy and the need to name it somehow arose from real world problems and real world events that um, made it indispensable. So I would first like to open the floor uh, to our panelists, but then of course, Joe, you can answer in person straight from the course's mouth. Well, I, maybe I'll answer quickly. So, so nothing, as you know, no philosophy article takes only two years to write. And um, th this was sort of had been th th this general idea that there's something wrong with the way in which people do applied ethics or practical ethics had been in my head since the very first paper I read on practical ethics. So I thought, no, this is no way to do serious intellectual work. Um, and I think I probably got the I, the clearest steer on this was, was from Janet Radcliffe Richards, where she used terms others have used of top down and bottom up. And I, I asked her, you know, what is the alternative to starting with a theory? And she said, well, you start with a theory and see what you've got that helps. Sorry, start with a problem and see what you've got that helps with it. And that's really, I think, the first time I heard anyone articulate that. And then when I looked at journals like Journal of Applied Philosophy, a lot of people were already doing that. Um, it's just that they hadn't, they hadn't named it. And you have a real problem, actually, because almost very often people are the only person working on a problem. So you can't really even get a conference together quite often because you, you know, people are doing such specialized stuff and so many people have to know about the area that uh, you, you can't get a discussion like this going. So you need to move to a level of abstraction so you can involve enough people in the, in the discussion. So you know, when I've gone to conferences called things like social justice in practice, You've either got people giving papers about very esoteric problems you've never thought about before or very general talks about methodology so it's quite actually a hard thing uh, to convene anyway I'll, i lost the thread of the topic there but um it it, it wasn't a reaction to brexit or trump <laughs> 
Uh, if I may add, uh, so I, I also don't think that, I mean, I, I can't say about uh, Joe Wall, but I can say, as I can see people doing uh, engaged philosophy, I also don't think that it's reaction to some failures of democracy, although I believe this will be an additional motivation to do more engaged philosophy. It seems to me that it's a reaction to, to reasonable pluralism, in fact, uh, because when you do applied philosophy, when you apply a philosophical theory or ethical theory on real world politics, you can do that only in a monistic and maybe even totalitarian regimes. So if you are a Marxist and you live in a, in Soviet Union or something like that, then you can uh, use a, a top-down <clears throat> approach and say, this is, the this is the correct theory of justice, and now we are going to implement it in the state. But in a pluralist societies, when you have different ideologies, so like social democracy, cons uh, conservatism, Christian democracy, neoliberalism, and so on, uh, and we all we consider them more or less reasonable. Uh, we have a problem that we see we, we cannot simply go top down and say this is a correct moral theory, therefore it has to be implemented. Uh, but in fact, we have to go <laughs> bottom up uh, and to see what uh, what can be what can be done to to solve our political problems. And this, in fact, reminds me a little bit, though only a little bit, on John Rawls and, and his approach. Uh, when Rawls says we need to focus on political and not on metaphysical. So uh, although uh, Rawls and uh, Wolf don't use the, the, the same approach, there are some similarities, it seems to me, uh, because just as uh, Joe Wolf says that those doing theoretical, non-engaged um, non philosophy are still valuable in a society because they can show us uh, the extent of, uh, of some political theory uh, and focus only on that, but they should, and they can have indirect political influence. Uh, they can write in the media like Peter Singer and so on, and then they can try to change the, the opinions people have, uh, but they should not be, they should not have direct political influence in the policy boards and so on. Uh, I think that the same, uh, Ross has similar ideas uh, because he says, we still need philosophers. Uh, we need philosophers doing metaphysical stuff. Uh, why do we, need, or, or doing stuff within uh, comprehensive doctrines? Uh, and we need them uh, for not to establish our legislation, but actually to provide additional reasons, uh, comprehensive reasons for the legislation. Uh, so it seems to me that this can maybe connect the two debates uh, and provide an interesting, uh, you know, starting point for future discussion. Thank you, Ivan. That was absolutely, absolutely true and absolutely fascinating. And what I would like to ask you next is whether we should all, um, well, I mean, I know what all of you are doing, so um, should we all adjust our work to the method that Joe is suggesting? Or should we try to satisfy his criteria, not because we are dogmatic about following the uh, suggestions listed in a certain article, but because they are simply the requirements of good research? Should we attempt to explore historical examples? Should we attempt to, exp to explore empirical evidence? Should we attempt to evaluate the re remaining options? Is this something that um, after Joe has articulated it, uh, are we missing something important if we don't do that? <laughs> I don't think that we should be so harsh on, <laughs> on, 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 <clears throat> on us, let's say, or on philosophers. Uh, I think that rather we can say that uh, philosophy and uh, policy making should lose something if it doesn't enter into the method of engaged philosophy. But actually, I think that as uh, 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 Joe said, that somehow it wouldn't be, uh, 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 I, he didn't propose actually that everyone should respect and enter into the engaged philosophy. And as I said in the article earlier, he, he said that we need, for example, good work, for example, on, on the notion of solidarity, a theory of solidarity in a sense, 
that we that then we can present and then engage and see what problems our theory of solidarity maybe can solve uh, where we got wrong and all of these things. So I think that there is actually uh, enough space for uh, uh, how to say pure theoretical work and uh, these approach of engaged philosophy. And I think that uh, one without each, uh, uh, the, it doesn't work in a sense, and it wouldn't be, uh, I don't think, good for philosophy. Thank you. If I, if I may, just to, to, to add that uh, concerning, you, you mentioned, you know, this requirement of the good research and all, all, all this debate. It seems to me that generally today, not only in philosophy, but you know, in uh, wider, not, not only in social social sciences and uh, humanities, but also we have a kind of moment in which you know the interdisciplinarity or multidisciplinarity is desirable, you know, and we also have a kind of uh, debate, you know, uh, whether the the earlier earlier um, uh, uh, dichotomy between fundamental and the applied sciences is the proper proper dilemma. Uh, also, you, we have, uh, you know, this kind of, uh, um, I don't know, uh, um, atmosphere in which, you know, we need to to go to 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 go um, to to you know, that we have a kind of walls. We build a kind of walls, you know, uh, at uh, at our institutions, you know, and we need you know to be much more open in many senses to other disciplines, to other approaches, to be uh, more engaged with the real world in sense of solving problems, not only in philosophy but also in the other sciences, you know. So even mentioned applied mathematics or the mathematics who can be applied in financial mathematics, or I don't know, you know, some, something like this. So there is a general uh, thing, it seems to me, that we now uh, try to rethink, you know, the scope of uh, sciences and researchers and the connection with the real world, you know, and there is a general moral that we need all to be much more engaged with the real, <laughs> with the real world and the philosophy definitely also, you know, so it seems to me that Wolf also catch, you know, the moment uh, uh, trendy in, in the good sense, you know, that uh, feel, feel this uh, moment in which, you know, the science try to rethink, you know, their own uh, tradition, goals, you know, to be much more involved uh, in, in the world. So, yeah, so. Thank you. Uh, Marco, do you have any other questions for our panelists? Yeah, so so I was thinking, just minding uh, of the time, uh, maybe we should invite those of you in the audience if if you would like to comment uh, or share your thoughts, feel free to to do so. Um, Or if if I mean, <clears throat> all I wanted to say, if I can add, I mean, there is still lots of job, traditional job for philosophers in in educating politicians. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. for example, <laughs> yesterday at the city council, there was a discussion that uh, the leading party got really annoyed because we wanted some kind of public competition for certain functionings. And then they said, well, on that function, there is already an expert and he would be, and it would be the same if he was chosen on public competition. So actually then, you know, you had to explain the, the difference between substance and mm. procedure. And then actually it does make sense if someone is appointed to the place and if someone is selected in the public competition. So all I wanted to say is that there is a job for philosophers to be engaged in a traditional way, explaining some traditional things to the, the decision makers. Okay. Thank you, Ivan. Uh, yes, so uh, I would like to, to, to change the, the direction of the question. And in fact, as a panelist asked something uh, to the audience, especially to Joe Wolf, uh, <laughs> But which regards the, your question, uh, should we focus on, uh, you know, uh, 
move from this theoretical philosophy and uh, or even applied philosophy and focused on engaged philosophy. And my question, I'm asking Jonathan uh, Wolf this because he has the most experience in engaged philosophy, I think of all of us here. And the question would be, can we do both? Uh, not necessarily to be like, like Russell and saying that one is philosophy and the other one is not, but can we really specialize in both? Or do you think that we have to, you know, to choose? Oh, I would like to be a theoretical philosopher or applied philosopher, uh, doing only utilitarian stuff. Or uh, so, how much time and dedication does it take to be a really good engaged philosopher or to be a really good theoretical philosopher? Well, so there's a question. Um, so the first uh, policy work I did was on gambling, um, because you know, 20 years ago, but all, but more than 20 years ago, I was asked to take part in a law review and it hadn't and, and at that time um it probably still is true that philosophers looked down their nose at professional ethics or applied ethics so there was this prestigious thing that was philosophy and if you didn't get a job in philosophy you did you taught philosophy in a business school or a medical school or you looked at applied topics and so you know, i had that sort of prejudice and, but then when I was asked to do this, it sounded like just good fun and something different. And um, I asked what involvement there would be. And they said, well, you know, you'd need to come to two meet, uh, 12 meetings over two years. You'd have to do some visits to casinos and things, which sounded all right. Um, but the report would be written by the secretariat, so I wouldn't have to worry about that. So it would just be attending the meetings, right? Got to the first meeting. I realized I knew absolutely nothing about the regulation of gambling in the UK. And so the idea I could make recommendations for changing without you know, really getting to grips with it and, and understanding it and reading the research around problem gambling because problem gambling was the big issue and there were psychologists and sociologists, one or two philosophers who'd written about it. So I spent two years of my life working on issues around regulation of gambling and thinking about it. And you, know, it, you can sort of see this on my CV. There was, there's no other publications stemming from that time. So I, I put everything else to one side and just worked on this for two years. Um, now I hadn't intended to. And in fact, when the report came out in those days, because applied work was so looked down on, I, it didn't even occur to me to put the report on my CV as a publication. I mean, it felt like it was something completely outside the realm of academia. So that took me two years. And then you know, the next thing I worked on was railway safety. And uh, I could integrate that more with philosophical work. I wrote some philosophy papers while I was doing this. But again, you know, I spent an enormous amount of my time reading cost-benefit analysis and trying to understand the principles of economics that was leading to cost-benefit analysis. And you know, I was reading about how... Uh, repair work is done on the railways so you, know, you if you're going to do say anything sensible about any any policy area you really have to immerse yourself into that policy area and this was a real problem for me when i came to update ethics and public policy the, the book because you know for a lot of the policy areas i just hadn't looked at them for 10 years and you know and part of my methodology was you know, if you say anything you have to be up to date so i had to do a huge amount of reading just to to come back but I would say at the same time, you know, I am, I am doing much more traditional political philosophy as well. So, you know, the work I've done on equality, okay, that now is, is much more in the engaged uh, aspect, but I, a lot of it was much more purely theoretical and conceptual. So I don't think there's anything that would stop you doing both of these things. And... Um, as uh, Naposha was talking about my 2015 paper, I had to think, what on earth, what was I writing in 2015? I couldn't, I couldn't even think you know, what I had done there. And this was a paper where I think I comment on Margaret MacDonald, who says that you know, the philosopher doesn't come up with a new idea. They point out something that is relatively neglected. So this now gives me another bit of anxiety, which I always have, which because I write so many things in different areas and say diff so many different th things, I have to worry, is it all consistent with each other? And am I giving methodological advice in one area that conflicts with methodological advice in another area? But does it matter? Because, you know, I'm, I think yeah, consistency is overrated anyway. And, and I believe lots of different things, and I'm not sure they're all consistent. So, um, But, yeah, I, I don't think there's any conceptual barrier 
to doing more than one thing. It's just, it's so time consuming. I mean, Annabelle Lever, I remember you know, talking to her, and Barry Smith, who works on the census, is that you know, people think that doing interdisciplinary work is easy. Somehow, you no, know, this is the, you know, this is the easy thing to do because you're not having to do that properly or, or that properly. But if you're doing it at all well, you have to get yourself to a level of knowledge in the field that um, you're not just going to be dismissed by people who know more. And that's really hard. And very often the rewards are not very high for it. So you, you do this interdisciplinary work, but maybe no one else is reading it. And so you've, put, you've spent two or three years of your life to come up with one paper that four people are going to read. So you know, why would you do that? You know, the, the easy thing to do is to go to the journal, see what the lively debate is, and see if you can have a make a contribution that advances that debate as a purely internal activity. So the rewards in philosophy are about making an intervention in a popular debate, rather than you know, breaking a new field, which you may end up being the only only person in. Thank you, Joe. Uh, and Snezhana, you raise your hand. So uh, I assume you have something fantastic to add. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I just want to 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 follow up on uh, on the Ivan's question and the and John's John's uh, answer. Um, actually, you know, the, the question whether we can stay, you know, in the both camps, you know, is the question. You know, uh, it's it reminds me whether it is something it's not so good or i don't know to be only in the engaged elements so probably we need to be also recognized as a theoretical philosophers you know so this is this all dichotomy we would like you know to be justified and recognized as the serious philosophers and then we would like you know to be you know engaged you know because we would like you know we have some of our ideals, you know, or something like that. But uh, uh, I just want to, to, to follow up uh, just today. Uh, this is my, my, my second life, you know, in, uh, in this management, university management today in Europe, uh, there, there is one very serious debate about, you know, a promotion, uh, what is academic career, you know, uh, mm -hmm. academic career in general. It is not just the publication of papers, you know, because there is a lot of, you know, um uh, what is it uh, problems concerning that what what just just said you know the, the uh, we are all concentrated to publish publish the papers not only in philosophy but generally you know and uh uh we do not know actually there is a pro proliferation of the of the papers you know and really we can think how many people read our our articles what is the influence of our our articles you know so uh this is really a kind of we stuck at some you know point with 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 this and now we have a very strong and for me very uh, important debate uh, in open science that and and actually the, the netherlands accepted this as, as you know the country not only some universities but this country that uh, actually academic careers need to recognize the different uh, uh, activities of, of uh, 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 scientists so for instance you know joe's work in these committees, you know, all these reports will be definitely evaluated according to these new documents as the very, very, you know, relevant element of their of his research. This is not just the hobby. It's just not, you know, their specific curriculum because Joe is interested and the people are interested in in, in his opinion. But it is really academic career, you know. So. Uh, a kind of diversification of research outcomes now is uh, on the table. And I think this is the also, you know, uh, something uh, very, very, very important This this kind of, uh, and because of that, I said that, that Joe just actually catch the moment, you know, in different senses in the article, but generally as with his CV, you know, I suppose that probably, um, in the future, I hope so, you know, the, 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 the scientists, the researchers, the academicians will be more like uh, Joe's, not staying, yeah, some of them definitely will stay in their uh, departments, teaching, researching, all of that, but, you know, it, I think that this is this uh, good trend, let us say, so. So um, hopefully the, the, you know, university administrations and, and institute directors will hear what you're saying, especially for uh, younger researchers that not to 
of course, publications and, and academic journals are important, but you know, if, if if we really want to change the world, we we sh we should also be doing something else. And that reminds me of kind of very um, important, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that kind of reminds me, you know, when, when I came to the Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory, what I I I thought, yeah, well, you know, look at the history of this institution. It really had a, a very you know a prominent public intellectuals that that really um in well for for most of you if it's familiar what was them yugoslavia you know they they really had had a huge influence and um even after the break breakup of our country uh you know some people still made a, an important difference not just a contribution but also an important difference in the general public sphere and in, in what was then I don't know, Serbia I guess I, I we, we changed our the name of the country so, so many times that it's difficult to uh, sometimes catch up on, on the exact year and you know so what Joe is here you know naming and I think that that's a, uh, an important point and an important contribution that you actually named something that that you know maybe we have been doing but we just didn't know what that we were doing it um that, that that's a, a, an important thing to acknowledge i think um uh if i may marco just just, yeah. just to add to to, to to your point uh actually that it seems to me that you know uh, skepticism towards science at this very moment now is partly produced by our, you know, completely isolation from the, you know, uh, 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 from the real world and uh, all this procedure, academician's procedure, et cetera, et cetera. So this silence of ration of center, rational centers, like as a center of rationality, is definitely, you know, one of the causes of all this culture of ignorance in which we live and all these consequences. Sorry. <laughs> So uh, we're approaching the end of our timeline. So I just wanted to close with this uh, fifth, final question. So we have this trend worldwide that student interest in philosophy is rapidly dropping because everybody feels they can only get a job in IT or uh, in engineering. Um, so, do, do you feel that engaged philosophy as something that is more interdisciplinary and that is more um, li lifelike might um, re-engage students in philosophy and might encourage them to consider philosophy not something that is pu purely abstraction or purely armchair thinking, but that it, as it is something that can change the world. So do you think that engaged philosophy might have something like that effect uh, on if it catches on on students worldwide? Yeah. Nevisha? Well, I hope so, but, uh, uh, but we shouldn't lose also, I, I want to follow what Ivan said earlier. Actually, this is also my my impression in organizing public lectures. That actually people are people are still interested in abstract questions, in all philosophical questions. So I don't think I think that we should work with engaged philosophy, and I hope that students will find this very uh, interesting. And I hope that some of them will engage in philosophy because they see that philosophy can be engaged. But I don't think that we should put all our cards on that table and that we should say, now enroll philosophy because see, we are engaged. No, I mean, we are philosophy. And philosophy can be engaged if you make it engaged. But you should come to philosophy because it is philosophy. And this is one perspective how you can do philosophy. But you can do it also, armchair philosophy and thinking about, uh, is there number two somewhere in the universe? I think this is actually... So, I, I want to have students who want to think, is there number two somewhere in the universe as much as that? I want to have students who want to say, uh, 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 
quantum question who is the disadvantage in the time of pandemic and really see how to help them. So I think that both of these students are students of philosophy. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Ivan? Yes, yes. If I'm, I mean, generally, I agree with Nebesha, though I can also see uh, the, the strong uh, points in, in your idea that uh, in contemporary a society when the interest for philosophy is, I mean, uh, as I can see, I, I, I never saw more people interested in philosophy and less people interested in studying philosophy or doing philosophy professionally. So people actually, they do want to come once in a while to, to, to hear talk about even something like Wittgenstein or something like that, not the, if it's accessible to them, but of course they don't want to, you know, dedicate their career and their life to philosophy. They want to be engineers or uh, I don't know, uh, work in pharmaceutical industry and so on. So I believe that uh, uh, engaged philosophy can help us. And I have one very, you know, concrete suggestion. Uh, since I'm also organizing a lot of events and doing a lot of uh, public relations and marketing related to those events, I think it's very important for philosophers uh, who, uh, who are in engaged philosophy and uh, who write, publish, and also participate in uh, policy uh, boards and so on, uh, when they appear in media to say that they are philosophers. Because for a lot of public intellectuals, you don't know that they are philosophers. And when you go to this interdisciplinary area, you have no idea what is their scholarly background. For example, I have here a book by uh, Carsten Stein. <coughs> And I had to Google whether he is a philosopher, a psychologist, a legal scholar. It turned out that he is a legal scholar. Uh, nonetheless, by just reading the book, uh, you have no idea which discipline it actually comes from. On, eh, that, that one, precisely that one. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> um, which discipline it actually comes from. Uh, so in order to popular, popularize philosophy, you actually have to present yourself as a philosopher even when you do interdisciplinary stuff. So that would be my suggestion. Uh, Snezhana, do you have anything to add to close with? Um, actually, you know, the Nebusha and Ivan said, said uh, uh, everything. I just want to, to say that I, I completely agree. I know that Nebusha would like you know, to be inclusive, not to, we do not want to replace, you know, the philo philosophy with engaged philosophy, you know. Uh, but uh, it is important also to say that we, we are uh, actually, Joe, Joe, Joe writes about the uh, uh, engaged political philosophy. We are all talking about, you know, the uh, applied ethics or engaged ethics. But also we are talking here about the applied and engaged epistemology. It seems to me that this is really, you know, wider than actually Joe's intended at the first, you know, just to be, you know, the engaged political, political philosophy. But, you know, what Ivan said, this is crucial for me, not to say, okay, yeah, you, you, we would like, you know, that you work philosophy, but there can be, the philosophy can be also engaged. It always means that something is wrong, okay, we can apply or do engaged philosophy. I, I would like to think that philosophy, uh, you know, to, to legitimize, you know, completely this engaged, engaged moment. Of course, philosophy, you know, theory, everything, but, you know, uh, 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 since we, we, we use this philosophy and it can be engaged, you know, it seems to me that it's always, you know, this hierarchical, you know, uh, uh, elements is there, you know, that there is a proper philosophy and real philosophy, and then we can also, you know, can do some interdisciplinary work or something like that. It seems to me that we need to change, you know, this, this narrative also. Yeah, thank you. Thank you and Elvio for the end of your question. We have two more minutes. Yeah, I will try to be even shorter than two minutes. So I, I would offer a few thoughts of support for what uh, the Nebusha was saying. So I think that our goal must be first to learn our discipline and the skills of our discipline. And if we look uh, for to, to a colleague and a friend who, who is an engaged philosopher in the best possible way, and this is Joe, obviously Joe uh, knows perfectly the skills uh, of his discipline and our discipline, as uh, also we heard yesterday, he had 
his presentation, but also from before yesterday, obviously, because my fear is uh, while watching these days on this TV series on Netflix is the chair, where in fact the kind of classes that uh, they are showing are something that reminds me more something like good student parties that we had a time when we were students. <laughs> and now, what uh, years ago were good student parties are now the model of the class that, as it have to happen at the academia. And this render things really very shallow and the engagement also that results to, from such approach, approach to discipline and to research is uh, such that uh, the engagement is so bad that it would be better not to have any engagement at all. So obviously this is only a TV series and I don't know whether it is the actual situation in some academic environments or it is our future. But in any case, I think it's a good ad admonishment and uh, also possible really seriously worrisome admonishment. So, my engagement is uh, engagement for learning, well, the discipline and the skills of the discipline first, then to develop the skills to be engaged with uh, what we learn in this way. Thank you, Elvio. I, that was an optimistic hope. Uh, uh, I think a very good way to and the, our conference, since, since we are out of time, and, and I'll first thank all of the panelists for today. So Snezhina, Ivan, and Abisha, thank you very much for, for participating in this panel. And thanks to Hannah for asking uh, questions. And I think this was a very good uh, and very lively discussion. Of course, uh, uh, many thanks to Joe for uh, agreeing to be a part of the conference that that was, as we said in the beginning, inspired by by his own academic, not just his paper, but uh, also his in academic work in general. So thank you very much for uh, doing uh, our philosophy in a way that I think gives inspiration to us younger younger researchers that you know, well, hey, we can do things a bit differently and and that that's not that's okay that's good uh we can still make a career out of it uh so so thank you for also being an inspiration and of course thanks everyone for participating not all of our uh presenters are here but i will thank them uh anyways for for uh presenting their work and uh works in progress i hope that um the discussions were useful uh, and that everyone enjoyed uh, these two days um, that we had. Unfortunately, I think Petar mentioned this in the beginning that, that we planned and, and hoped to have the conference in, in person and then that was the initial plan, but unfortunately as cir circumstances are such that we, we had to move it entirely online that hopefully uh, we, there will be another opportunity to, to meet uh, uh, as, as, and hopefully that this, this situation that the world is in will soon end. I think we, we've all had enough of that. Um, so thank you everyone once again. Uh, and I hope you, you all enjoyed uh, the past two days. So thank you and I'll, and with a an applause i don't see the for for joe and for everyone who participated i don't see the uh, um, <laughs> button uh, here uh, i only see the raising hand option so so yes here's the here, here's the applause to to everyone so thank you um and that's it for from us and thank, thank you so much marco for organizing thank and you, Hannah, thank, you. Well. thank you thank you joel Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Hannah. Thank I you, Joe. Do you have petrol? Petrol? Uh, well, I don't. Well, I'm okay because I don't have a car, so uh, so it, it doesn't affect me. But uh, no, I'm I'm guessing. So we've got these WhatsApp groups 
uh, in the building I live in and at work, and the only topic at the moment is where there's petrol. <laughs> I mean, it's really amazing. You know, maybe, maybe something that you were used to 20 years ago, but we, it's, it's exactly. Just... I was just about to say, if you need advice, you know, I think uh, people from from this uh, region are, are well versed uh, in 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 such situations. Although back then you, you, we didn't have uh, uh, you know so much technology and mobile phones and WhatsApp groups, so so you had to go actually outside to to buy a liter of of, of <laughs> gas from some strange person that you you don't know <laughs> um, yeah no it uh, it will <coughs> i think sort itself out in, in a while but it's um, very embarrassing and awkward for people at the moment yeah particularly as so many people were uh, not using public transport because of covid and using their cars mm. now they can't so anyway um Great to see you all. So many familiar faces and um, see you in person before long. I yeah. Hope. Hope so. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye.